<coughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for this presentation. I know it's the last session of the day. My name is George Mihaescu. I'm uh, the cloud architect for the Cancer Genome Collaboratory Project in the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And I'm here today with my colleague, Jared Baker, who is the cloud engineer working with me to support this environment. OICR, uh, or Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, is the largest cancer research institute in Canada and one of the largest in the world. It focuses on uh, prevention, early detection, diagnosis, and treatment of cancer. Located in Toronto, downtown Toronto, it's funded by the Government of Ontario. And uh, it also hosts the Secretariat for the ICGC and uh, its Data Coordination Center. ICGC is an international, uh, it's a voluntary scientific organization uh, created with the goal of collecting and analyzing 500 tumor uh, normal pairs for the 50 most common types of cancer. ICGC is the largest global project of its kind uh, with members from all over the world. And uh, for every type of cancer uh, covered by ICGC, it receives DNA samples from patients of two or more countries uh, in order to cover more variety. And then uh, the data collected is um, analyzed using the same algorithms for consistency. Cancer Genome Collaboratory is a cloud computing environment that was built for cancer research by YCR. Uh, it enables large-scale research on the data sets uh, generated by ICGC. And uh, the project goals in terms of infrastructure was to build, uh, were to build a, an environment uh, offering 3,000 compute cores and being able to um, store 15 petabytes of data very large data sets generated by ICGC. Also, uh, one other goal was to create a system that allows cost recovery to make this project self-sufficient after funding from the government um, finishes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, genomics for those of you who are not uh, in um, genomics uh, research field. So uh, basically, you'll understand better the decision, design decisions that we had to make. Uh, the new generation of sequencing machines produces more data and faster than ever before. Probably you heard that many times in the news. Uh, the human DNA has three billion uh, best base pairs, and the sequencing machine scans the organic material and produces an unaligned file. Okay? It's similar to a book with the pages unordered, which cannot be used right away. Uh, in order to actually use that uh, data, you have to uh, align this uh, genome based on a reference genome, okay? So you take the reference genome and you take the unaligned file and uh, you align it. And this process is a very CPU and time consuming. So, um, and for each uh, donor, researchers need at least two files. One for the DNA of a normal sample from a tissue that's not cancer uh, affected and one from the biopsy of the tumor. Some patients have multiple tumors, so multiple files. Uh, it takes about five days on a virtual machine with four cores uh, to align a single file. And again, you have two files at least per patient. The workflows uh, usually happens, uh, the researchers download the, the files uh, if they are um, looking at uh, finding the mutations between the normal and the tumor sample. So the download the files could be between 150, 300 gigabytes, and then analyze the data for days or weeks, depending on the coverage on the file. Uh, the resulting uh, output can be as large as the input if you just align the files. If you are doing uh, um, further analysis, like a a VCF calling, you just find the mutations, the output is usually five to 15 gigabytes. So much smaller data sets. But at scale, it adds up. Uh, it is also recommended that the workflows, uh, the workflows to be independent, which means that um, if you have a compute node that fails, you are not uh, affecting a large scale analysis, you just affect one donor, one analysis, which you can reschedule on another VM, on another compute node, okay? So no external dependencies. And uh, we see uh, the bioinformaticians packaging their workflows in Docker containers for uh, better portability uh, and reproducibility. I'm going to show you a little a bit, uh, a few slides about uh, the, um, the stress that uh, um, research uh, impact on, on the, on the um, resources uh, for the VM. So basically, this is a slide of CPU usage on a VM with eight cores. It ran for about 12 days. As you can see, it was 100% CPU usage most of the time, uh, 
except for a few steps when it was doing something less CPU. So the workflows um, have like 15, 17 steps. Uh, most of the time they are CPU intensive, but some of them are maybe not uh, parallelized or they do other things like merging files. So, but most of the time you see 100% CPU usage. Um, at the end of the workflow, the results can be uploaded back into the object storage or on a cinder volume for persistent storage or upload it somewhere else. This is a slide that shows memory usage. As you can see, uh, most of the time, memory utilization was about 12 gigabytes out of the 47 gigabytes provided to the VM. But there are steps when the VM, uh, that's the available um, uh, memory usage, drops to half, okay? So you basically have to provide the VM with enough memory for its peak usage. Otherwise, the workflow is gonna fail and there is no use for it. And some workflows have different memory profiles, depending who wrote it and how they are using memory in, in uh, the workflow. This is a um, screenshot that shows the disk I.O. usage, uh, which is high only at the beginning of the workflow when the data is downloaded from the object storage and saved on the disk. After that, minimum um, I.O. So basically, it reads the data from the disk in uh, big chunks uh, works in the uh, CPU is basically stressed, but not the disk, which means that uh, if the workflows are scheduled properly, like a two, three hours intervals, they can overlap on the same compute nodes and do not um, contend for um, disk I.O. So basically, uh, in conclusion, the modern cancer research lies on large scale studies because of the extreme diversity of uh, mutations. So we decided that capacity was more important than uh, speed when we designed collaboratory. Uh, being able to run more workflows and analyze more data gives researchers uh, more confidence than the insight that uh, their uh, analysis provides is correct. Just running an analysis on three samples, you can draw a conclusion. You have to run it on 100, 300 to actually confirm that that result actually uh, stands up. Also, building for high performance is very expensive, as you probably know, and whatever we build today, it is only going to be cheaper tomorrow. So we decided to uh, build for capacity and we can upgrade the slower parts of the system as technology uh, is more affordable, like SSD drives, for example. Wisely pick your battles. Uh, in terms of design philosophy, we knew that uh, if we provide a new OpenStack service that is not very stable or uh, well documented, we have to support it. Also, if we run a not uh, very well tested or less stable Ceph uh, configuration, we have to support it. We are talking about very large data sets. So um, data corruption, it makes it very hard to uh, re-inject the data from other sources. So you don't want to necessarily go with uh, erasure coding or more complex uh, uh, story strategies that might have hidden bugs and later lose all your data. With just two of us administering the environment uh, and no support provider to rely on, we have to be careful on which feature we implement. If it's not something that's uh, very uh, well, we use very much used by our users. We don't necessarily have to uh, deploy like load balancer as a service or other uh, features. We employ the new fields design. So we use high density servers. Uh, this reduces our footprint and requires less space um, in the racks, in the data center, less PDUs, less switches, less management overhead. Um, you'll see uh, our uh, design rack. Basically, we use all the space in the rack, 48 U's. We use uh, all the ports on the 10 gig switch. We also mix compute and storage in the same rack. Um, this has the benefit of lowering the power usage per rack, uh, heat generation. Also, keep some of the Nova to Cinder uh, traffic in the same rack. So when the VMs attach Cinder volumes, uh, they will read from the primary replicas, which some of them will be on Ceph nodes in the same rack, so no east-west traffic. Other design constraints, we only had 12 data center racks um, reserved, and uh, although we have a fixed budget for infrastructure uh, resources, we also have the flexibility, being a four-year uh, research grant, 
to uh, stagger purchases, uh, which allowed us to maximize the compute and storage uh, per dollar spent. So for example, we started with uh, four terabyte drives for Ceph, and then next uh, purchased six terabyte, and then moved into eight terabytes. So as drive sizes increase, and they are cheaper, we, we buy more. We are now at more than four petabytes on the, on the storage side. Also, this allowed us to avoid sitting on all the equipment uh, near the end of the project that was maybe cutting edge three years ago when the project started. This is a um, uh, rack uh, layout. So we use eight U of space in the rack um, at the top to pack 16 individual compute nodes. Okay, so we have four 2U chassis. Each 2U chassis has four compute nodes. Uh, in total, we have about 640 cores per rack and up to 2.3 petabytes of Ceph storage in the eight uh, storage nodes below. Each compute node has six two terabyte drives in a RAID 10. Uh, RAID 10 gives us a good I.O. performance and redundancy. They also have 156 gigs of RAM and 40 cores, which gives a very good, uh, very generous uh, resource ratio. So memory per core, it's about between six and eight gigs. The average bioinformatics flavor that our researchers use has eight cores, 48 gigs of RAM, and one terabyte of disk, because the files that they download can be very large. The largest um, genomics file that we have, it's an 800 gigabyte file. Okay. That's an exception, but not necessarily. In the future, depending on the sequencing machines and the resolution that the researchers use when they sequ sequence, can, can be, that could be the norm. Uh, the VMs run from local storage, uh, and because each compute node has just a few large VMs, okay, like 40 cores divided by eight cores per VM, four or five VMs per compute node, if there is any I.O. contention, so if there are a step when they all use the disk, that's going to be localized to the compute node where it happens. It's not going to impact the entire cluster, um, Ceph, okay, so we don't uh, have a latency um, concern. The drawback of uh, local storage is that live migration cannot be easily done. Uh, it's not a good fit for large VMs that have a lot of local disk um, and also uh, high CPU usage, uh, memory usage, uh, probably a live migration it wouldn't even complete if you start to migrate something like that. Uh, we treat the environment as a pure cloud environment where failure is uh, a given. So if a researcher, we don't have usually uh, higher failures that take the entire compute node, but if you have a kernel panic, you lose uh, maybe five VMs that were in uh, doing analysis, they can reschedule, start somewhere else. The, this is the storage node uh, chassis, so um, 36 drives per 4U. Um, we are using, as I said, uh, collocated journals. Um, basically, each node has 48 cores to 256 gigs of RAM. This improves read speeds as well as recovery and rebalancing operations. Uh, the servers also have 40 uh, gigabits of uh, network, 210 gigs front end, 210 gigs back end. Um, the SSD-based journals would not help us because um, it's a read-intensive object storage cluster, okay? So the reads always come from the primary replica and they come from the hard drives. They don't come from the journals. And uh, to, to use 20% of the capacity, like one in six ratio, to provide uh, journals on SSDs, that means 20% of space that could be used to store data is just used to write, to cache writes, okay? Not a good use for uh, space or money in our, in our case. Uh, we use Ceph as a backend for Glance and Cinder, but as I said, uh, the pool that has the um, highest usage is the Rados Gateway uh, buckets pool where we store the data. On the volumes pool, we have uh, a smaller um, quota and uh, we made other um, optimizations to the Redus Gateway as well, I will talk about later. Uh, on the control plane uh, side, we have a pretty standard, highly available setup. Uh, three controllers, HAProxy and Kipo Live D. Um, what we have, um, so we invested in uh, good hardware for the controller uh, servers. We uh, have SSDs 
six SSDs in the control servers. We split them in three RAID 1 sets. We have a RAID 1 for Cephmon, so it has space and I.O. dedicated in case of recovery. MySQL has its own dedicated RAID 1 on top of SSD and uh, MongoDB for Silometer, although we're not, we're not using right now. Um, we do HA proxy uh, in front of the APIs and Rados Gateway with SSL termination. We switched uh, to ECC certificates, which uh, helped us with the CPU usage on the HA proxy side. Um, we use the VLANs on top of bonds, so the controller nodes, because um, they are in the north-south data path, we uh, use four 10 gigs in a bond, and then we have VLANs for uh, self-public, uh, management, GRE, and um, uh, monitoring. Uh, we use 10 gigabits per second Ethernet uh, everywhere. This keeps the cost down. Uh, there is no need to buy expensive transceivers, Okay. Cabling is not as nice as with fiber, but again, um, we are not picky. We want it to build at scale, and you cannot do that if you do expensive stuff. Okay. So we want to basically spend most of the money on, on uh, capacity. Um, we have 10 gigabits per, uh, per second upstream to, to the internet as well for uh, data um, just from, from uh, other uh, data repository uh, across the world. And we use the Neutron Plus GRE because it was deployed more than two years ago and uh, GRE had better support. And um, we don't use DVR, just HA routers. We control better the traffic in and out if we have connected to the internet just on the three controllers. In terms of networking, the top of rack switches are stacked in a ring topology. Okay, and this is a brocade stack. The nice part about it is that it has 48 10 gigs uh, going to the servers, copper, and also has 640 gigs um, uplinks. And uh, because they are in a ring, we cable three uh, twin NAS cables to the rack on the left and three cables to the right. So we have 240 gigs uh, east-west between the racks. And if we lose any of the racks, traffic goes on the other side of the ring. Okay. So we get redundancy, no blocked links, and uh, two to one over subscription ratio, which is pretty good. Um, again, uh, we use Twinox cables, very uh, inexpensive versus transceivers and fiber and so on. Software stack, uh, of course, open stack. Uh, we are running on top of Ubuntu 14.04. Um, we use Ansible for configuration, Grafana uh, for uh, graphs, um, Zabbix uh, for monitoring, Elk for log aggregation. Pretty standard, I guess most of you probably use something similar. Um, we also use ARA, which is a new tool for Ansible um, run analysis. We also developed uh, our own object storage client uh, on top of the S3 API. Uh, this allows us to basically give access to researchers uh, based on temporary URLs, okay? So this is protected data. Researchers who are authorized to download the data basically uh, use this uh, storage client. They receive a token from us that they can use to uh, feed into the client and uh, they say, I want to download this file, the, to the, the, the object storage client connects to a, a server which uh, confirms that their token is authorized and generates a temporary URL that they can use to download the data. Uh, the temporary URL, uh, of course, is valid for a limited uh, time, so after that, it's not good anymore. Uh, the tool uh, supports S3, Swift, and Azure, and uh, has some nice features like uh, Resumable downloads, multi-parallel uploads and downloads, also um, BAM slicing. BAM is a file format used in genomics, and uh, it allows you this tool to uh, re request just a portion of the BAM file, okay? Uh, basically, you can say, give me just chromosome three, this section, instead of downloading the entire file. And you can feed it, um, a file that contains multiple uh, objects, and you want just chromosome trees, this section from all of them, and you get back just that. 
Tens of Cloud usage uh, in more than, two, more than two years, we launched more than 57,000 instances. Uh, this value includes the hourly uh, rally triggered uh, instances because we use the rally to uh, monitor the health of the environment. So uh, it sounds like a very large number, uh, but it includes also this uh, hourly, uh, but it still shows uh, the usage of the OpenStack um, environment. What's interesting is that uh, for a bioinformation that develops a new workflow uh, and starts short-lived instances, or any developer uh, doing this in a non-public uh, in, in a non-public cloud is very valuable. Uh, if you start an instance in a public cloud and you keep it running five minutes, you are uh, charged for an hour. Okay? If you do this 20 times in an hour, you are you pay 20 hours. Okay? If you start the instance at 157, and it runs till three minutes later, you are charged two hours. So if you do development in a private cloud, you can start instances that run for three minutes and then terminate, and then you do it again as much as you want. Don't do that in a public cloud because it's going to be expensive. We also developed our own uh, usage reporting app that uh, can be used by the principal investigators to track uh, usage of their resources by the members of their teams and also sends emails uh, with reports. And uh, this is going to allow us to do cost recovery. In terms of OpenStack upgrades, uh, we started with Juno, then upgraded to Kilo, Liberty, and Mitaka. All these upgrades were live. We still notified the users and um, that we are doing an upgrade. We ask them to um, abstain from creating new instances in that uh, time frame. Uh, we make use of virtualized labs to test new version of OpenStack. Um, we do basic configuration testing, take care of hard deprecations, database upgrades, etc. Uh, and then we leverage uh, HAProxy to minimize the impact to our users. We take one controller out of the pool, we upgrade it, test it individually, put it back, and so on. Self upgrades, we started with Giant. Uh, and then upgrade to Hammer and then Jewel. Um, same uh, process. Um, Ceph was great, very stable. Uh, again, we are not using any fancy feature. No uh, erasure coding, no snapshots on top of snapshots. And okay, uh, we don't have uh, a latency um, uh, sensible environment. Um, we also uh, use Ansible to to uh, roll over the upgrades. Um, also, it's very useful to have uh, historical performance graphs that allows you to see if after an upgrade, performance degrades or is improves, hopefully. And uh, I'm going to pass now to Jared to discuss more of the operational, daily operational tasks. Thank Thanks, George. Um, yeah, my name's Jared. Uh, I work with George and I have been working with OpenStack since last August. Uh, so far, it's been pretty fun. So uh, today, I'm going to go over some operational details and lessons learned with the collaboratory. So security updates. Uh, they happen much more frequently than OpenStack and Ceph upgrades, but we use the same methodology as Ceph and OpenStack upgrades. We leverage use of host aggregates that include reserved nodes for testing, to test security up updates against our compute nodes. Security updates on our controllers, uh, the, that gets a bit more involved. Since our controllers have load balance services, we can use HAProxy and KeepAlive-D to isolate a controller service during updates by bringing them out of the load balancing pool. Uh, once out of the pool, we test the controller's API directly using an API script that we've developed. Uh, if everything looks good, back in the pool it goes. So because the system is designed to be HA, we can do controller and Ceph maintenances live during business hours. Uh, for the most part, we can roll through those updates and reboots transparently to our users with typically only kernel updates on our compute nodes uh, requiring reboots and notifications to the users. Uh, I mean, why not migrate the instances off those compute nodes that we're rebooting? Well, I mean, we do have the ability to migrate them, uh, but as George said, 
large local disks, potentially I.O. intensive workloads going on in them. So we take those case by case. I mean, it would be pretty difficult to migrate a fleet of VMs that have a lot of heavy I.O. going on them. So, I mean, sometimes uh, we have to migrate those and, and uh, usually it works. So let's, let's talk tools. Uh, we use a variety of tools for monitoring, but uh, Elk in particular has been pretty useful at parsing and making sense of all the logs that the environment is generating. We can create custom dashboards in Kibana to suit our monitoring needs. The dashboards provide a really easy way to show at a glance if something is misbehaving. So for example, in these, in these pie charts here, uh, they represent who is logging the most stuff. We can categorize each pie chart by log type or even server type. And we find this really handy if we've left something in debug or if something's actually wrong, as they will stick out like a sore thumb. So here's another uh, Kibana dashboard that we made. This one is focused on web analytics for our OpenStack dashboard. Here we can see the login statistics, top URLs, uh, HTTP status codes, and even geographical location using the GOIP plugin. The idea here is having good tools and monitoring is crucial for being able to manage things at scale, especially on a small team. So deployments, uh, everybody loves deployments, right? It means you've got new hardware, it's shiny, and maybe you even get to kick the bucket on some old hardware that uh, just never worked right. So deployments are triggered by capacity planning and have been happening about twice a year each time adding compute and storage nodes, in the odd time, we expand into a new rack and uh, add all the fix-ins like a switch, PDUs, et cetera. So, and we're, since they don't happen all that often, we're, we're tweaking them as needed, documenting as much as possible about the deployment and referring to our previous documentation. We've started to use uh, MAS or Metal as a Service to lay down the operating system, configure, the NIC bonds, IPs, and partitions, and it's been working out well, but with, like any automation tool, it required a bit of testing before it worked the way we wanted, uh, but now it's paying dividends. So once we're finished with MAS, uh, we switch to our Ansible playbooks during uh, deployments to push installations of our various tools, monitoring software, OpenStack packages, and configurations. From this point forward, we use Ansible to make any future configuration changes and keep things consistent. So some operational details here. Uh, we let Ceph heal itself for things like drive failures. And what I mean by that is when a disk fails, we let the cluster rebalance and settle. Then we can work with our on-site technicians to replace the disk. This is transparent to the user and has worked out well thus far. We also spare on site about 4% of our hard drives uh, so that we have inventory during failures. This helps resolve uh, any immediacy to replacing a disk while we file the paperwork with our vendor to get a replacement. We also set up CEPHs so that, it rebalance, uh, so that rebalances aren't triggered automatically if a full rack is down, which is like our, our, our failure domain, our fault domain, uh, but it will rebalance for smaller events like a host failing or drive failures. Uh, Zabbix is at the core of our monitoring and alerting. We use it to check and graph everything. Um, we basically have historical graphs for many obscure things which you might not think you need right away, but uh, when something goes wrong and you want to have some kind of historical context to it, it's something that we can rely on for that. And uh, like any good sys administrator or DevOps, Many scripts have been developed to make our lives easier or to check things uh, that we've experienced silent failures for in the field. Uh, for example, we have a script that monitors and keeps our glance images up to date so that we know our users are deploying new instances that are well patched and up to date. We also got a, uh, a mailing list made so that we can send announcements to our users if we're doing notifications. And um, our team also developed a website so that people can sign up and read, it, read more about the project. ERA, um, Ansible Run Analysis. We use this tool. Uh, it's new to us. We appreciate the effort that's gone into its development. It helps us easily digest our playbook runs. 
So, I mean, gone are the days of scrolling through hundreds of lines in a terminal looking for the things that Ansible changed that we didn't expect. This way we get like a nice tabulated format that we can sort and see exactly what's changed really quickly. So let's talk a, a little bit about networking. We use VLAN-based networking in this OpenStack deployment. This has some obvious networking benefits such as smaller broadcast domains, but it also segments out nicely for monitoring and is well supported and understood. So networking at the compute and storage level are configured with multiple 10 gig ports. And from those ports, we create a bond where some are load balanced, and then we layer on VLAN interfaces on top of the bond for different types of traffic, management, GRE, Ceph public, et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about Ceph and monitoring Ceph. So we've got this uh, trifecta of uh, Ceph monitoring Docker containers, which are CollectD, Graphite, and Grafana. And we uh, have dedicated dashboards just for Ceph. I mean, in this screenshot, I'm showing the IO profile, or how the IO profile differs in our environment between volumes and the object store. We've got a lot of reading from the object store, but not a lot of IOPS, uh, whereas compared to volumes, we see more of a mix of reads and writes. Uh, and this is because our Ceph cluster is predominantly used for reads from the object store. I mean, researchers are pulling large genomic files down to the instance's local disk. Uh, and as George said, this allows us to get away with more capacity versus performance ratio and, and no need for SSDs in our compute nodes. So we can just cram our storage nodes with just large multi-terabyte disks. So we perform hourly downloads from the object store with very large files in order to have long-term performance metrics available. This download also verifies the integrity of the object storage by performing a hash check on the file. So this information is particularly useful to have after Ceph upgrades or uh, other related system changes. Rados gateway throughput. Uh, we're load balancing 10 Rados gateway instances across five servers, and we're able to achieve 28 gigabits of throughput from the Rados gateway thanks to the use of uh, the ECC certificates at HA proxy, and we allocate 20, 22 cores to HA proxy and keep a watchful eye out for performance improvements in uh, like future HA proxy change logs. So I'm gonna talk a bit about our observations during uh, Ceph rebalancing events. In this screenshot here, we are adding uh, new storage nodes with 36 drives into the cluster. The network throughput reached more than 14 gigabits taking advantage of the provided 20 gigabits. Uh, more than 20 gigabits would have likely been overkill in this uh, storage node configuration with 36 drives. Uh, more proof on that in the next couple of slides. So here's a capture of CPU utilization during a Ceph rebalancing event, and this helps us identify bottlenecks. We can see that for this rebalancing effort, most of the CPU time is spent in IO wait and this tells me that we're not bottlenecked by the CPU and there's more than enough computing power for the 36 drives. Here's a capture of uh, memory usage and we see very minimal consumption of memory during this rebalancing event. We could get away with less RAM in the future, uh, in a future storage server specification, but I, I guess it's always safe to err on the side of, of too much than too less, if you can. Uh, and in this screenshot here, we see the individual disks and their respective IOPS. In this case, the SAS disks appear to be at their maximum IOPS rating during the rebalance. So that tells me in this particular rebalance event, um, you know, the disks are the choke point. And here we see um, a capture of the rebalance event and how the data gets shuffled between storage nodes. So the two top uh, graphs are uh, existing storage nodes and the two bottom ones are brand new. And as we introduce those new nodes to the cluster, we see, now this is just a small snapshot. There's many other servers in the cluster, but as you can see, the existing nodes, they start to offload some data onto the new nodes, which are just, just um, chugging along, ingesting lots of data to get up to the right ratio with the rest of the cluster. 
So Rally is another tool that we use. It's excellent for keeping tabs on the functionality and performance of your OpenStack and Ceph environment. We use Rally to verify end-to-end -end functionality by simulating what a user might do. They can test a lot of components at once, like Nova, Glance, Neutron, and Cinder, and saves a lot of time versus doing it manually. In addition to functionality testing, we use Rally for stress testing the cluster, and we often use this after making configuration changes or an upgrade. Uh, we can set up a large task to simulate heavy cluster usage and analyze the results. So just this, this slide here, this is like a, uh, the rally result is essentially outputted to an HTML file, and we, for each rally test, we have an HTML file. So as it, you can imagine, reviewing a whole bunch of rally tests uh, to see trends is, is kind of difficult. So what we do is, at scale, um, we just pump those rally results into Grafana and graph them. That way we have a much easier um, historical view of uh, those rally tests and how they performed. So I mean, you can put anything into Graphite and graph it with Grafana. It's a really useful tool. Uh, for example, in this screenshot, we are looking at a collection of active projects uh, active OpenStack projects in our cloud and what percentage of their quota has been used. And this helps us to determine if we have any stale or constrained projects. And the data from this graph is generated from a bash script, right, George? Yeah. Yeah. So that's enough tools for me, probably enough tools for you, so I'm gonna hand it back to George. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the lessons learned uh, after operating this environment for two years. Uh, it was initially just me and then uh, Jared. So um, basically, uh, if something needs to be running, uh, you have to test it. You can just uh, assume that it is running. We had cases, for example, where the neutron metadata service was not running properly in a project. And uh, the IP tables rules that are supposed to perform NAT between the Neutron 169 address on port 80 and Neutron server, the IP tables rule was not there, okay? Just for just that project. So after we fixed that by restarting the Neutron metadata server and the IP tables rule came up, we said, okay, let's put a Zabbix check that goes into each uh, namespace on the controller <coughs> and looks for <laughs> these IP tables uh, rules. If it's there, okay, once a minute. Um, simple tasks sometimes are not. Uh, we did a regular security upgrade, and uh, because we are running um, Mitaka and uh, Canonical had a uh, dual part of the Mitaka um, repo, we uh, upgraded uh, a component of Ceph on some nodes. Okay, we didn't expect that. So we basically <laughs> were running uh, the entire cluster on Hammer, but some parts were uh, on Jewel, not Jewel for Ceph repo, but Jewel built by Ubuntu. It worked, but it was a scare. Um, <laughs> um, it's good to have more RAM and CPU on the Ceph storage side because uh, this allows you to have uh, larger nodes and not be affected by small memory uh, leaks. Okay, like we have 256 gigs. Uh, as you can see in the previous graph, we maybe use 50 gigs, but uh, the other 200 helps with uh, caching reads, okay? And if in the future, Ceph has a memory leak, we will be able to get away with it for a while. Um, also, you can run very economical configurations for your compute nodes, which are a lot, so that's where you want to be very uh, strict about um, designing uh, really for scale, but for the infrastructure node that does the monitoring on your controllers, you should be more generous. Um, so we have 128 gigs of RAM on our Zabbix server that also has uh, Grafana and has an ELK stack that stores 300 million logs uh, on SSD disks. So as we scale the environment, we still have a lot of uh, capacity uh, and performance on the infrastructure node. In conclusion, uh, it's possible to run uh, a stable and performant OpenStack without paying for support um, with few qualified resources. What you have to be careful of is uh, design it well, 
choose the most stable uh, features of OpenStack and Ceph. And um, if it's not needed, then don't uh, try to uh, make it work or to deploy it, because you are going to spend a lot of time for a very little uh, benefit. As uh, feature plans, we have to upgrade to Ubuntu 16.04 in order to uh, move on to Newton and then Okata. And that's uh, uh, the next um, item on our to-do list. Uh, we have uh, another research uh, grant coming that's going to build a new and larger environment and uh, for which we are going to use the Lipspine networking design because the um, stack ring has a limitation of 12 uh, switches, so we cannot go more than 12 racks. Uh, it's good enough for collaboratory, but it's not going to be good enough for this new project, so we are going to go with the spine leaf uh, architecture. We are also looking at uh, moving from Debian packages and Ansible to uh, containers, but we had mixed results with uh, Dockers uh, running in production. Uh, it's pretty unstable from my point of view, so um, I'm not quite ready to run the entire control plane on Docker containers. But definitely, as technology matures, we'll be doing that. I would like to, in conclusion, uh, thank the funding agencies, and um, we are open for questions. Yes? So the question was if we are considering using erasure coding for uh, Radius Gateway, no. As I said, uh, I've seen people on the mailing list uh, losing data with erasure coding, and uh, recovery uh, is tricky. Um, we have a few customizations on the Rados Gateway, so uh, we upload the very large genomic files, like 150 gigabytes files, into one gigabyte multi-parts, okay? And then Rados Gateway chunks the data into 65, 64 megabyte Rados blocks. This keeps the number of Rados objects in the Rados Gateway pool manageable, okay, still millions, but could be much larger if we go with the default four megabytes. Also, having large Rados objects helps with uh, an, uh, an increased reader head on the storage, on the drives, helps retrieving the data. So erasure coding, um, it's not something that uh, I'm ready to support in production. We know support paid from Red Hat and no uh, easy to access backups for 540 terabytes of data. Yes. Thanks for talk, guys. It's a good content. Uh, yeah. How are you using your object storage? Is it S3 uh, and Swift? S3. S3. I mean, it can be accessed as Swift, but uh, our uh, custom object client talks uh, using uh, S3, but the client also was uh, rewritten to talk to uh, the Microsoft Object Storage Azure and also to uh, Amazon. And uh, I think there is work in progress to make it uh, compatible with Swift. Okay. But natively is S3. Yeah. And second question, you mentioned about you tuned RGW for some performance improvement. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, basically um, the client uh, um, uploads into one gigabyte files. We will use 64 megabytes chunks on the Rados gateway. Uh, we switch on the HAProxy to ECC certificates, which lower the CPU utilization on HAProxy side. Uh, we use uh, eight megabytes reader head on the drives. Um, that's just a few of the... Um, Optimizations that uh, we, we made. All right, all right. Just one comment to make. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about erasure coding on on object storage. So I've been doing a lot of testing with that, and uh, it's it's completely supported by Red Hat, and uh, people are using it in production right now. But let's talk about it. Sure. Hey guys. Um, yeah, yes. I have a question for you. Yeah. By the way, thanks for a great content. Sure. Um, in terms of mass, right? Are you using it like as a standalone, or are you using it with conjunction? Uh, with Juju? No, just mass. Stand just mass. So alone. you're doing the, the rest of the stuff with what, with Ansible, like deployment, new deployments, how are you doing that? Yes. Yeah, we take, we use mass as, as far as we can, as far as we can take it without getting too much in the weeds with it. As, uh -huh. as you know, the documentation's not so hot, I guess. Um, hopefully that changes, but we get it to a point where we can take over with Ansible. 
Yeah. Okay, and, and mass itself, are you doing it all automatically or there is some manual work? I mean, server provisioning, for example. Yeah, I mean, uh, it dynamically discovers any new nodes that are coming onto the network, but we do, it, it is a pain point for me, I do have to uh, configure the partitions, configure the IP addressing and Yourself, all that. Right? I mean, at least I, mean, I have a, a fast UI to do it with. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to find out how to automate that, absolutely. Okay, okay. so it's still like, kind of struggling with that, right? Yeah. Okay. But again, we are adding capacity like twice a year, one rack at a time. So it's a few days of work to lay down the OS and then maybe not even a few maybe Yeah, one if, if we days. were doing deployments more often, that would be much higher on my priority list to resolve for sure. Okay. And um, uh, the question around networking. So how does your networking look like? Uh, as of today, like, is it a single broadcast domain, or like, is it, I saw that it's a stack, right? But um, how are you connecting your servers to uh, to that stack? Like, so is we have a trunk port or something else. Yeah, there are trunk ports going to all the servers, and they carry multiple VLANs. One VLAN for management, one for IPMI. Actually, no, IPMI is uh, on out of band. Yeah, some so, are some are dedicated, yeah. and then the the front end interface, any 10 gig interface, is gonna gonna be trunked for sure. I have and, four and or five maybe VLANs. Load balanced, depending on if it's compute node or storage node. Okay, okay. Thank you. I think okay, we have cool. to stop the recording, and if you have any questions, we can answer them. Okay, yeah. No, I'm good. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.